The cells of our body can break down, can oxidize fatty acids into acetyl coenzyme A molecules. But what happens to these acetyl coenzyme A molecules next? Well, it depends on the conditions inside our cells. So if we have high levels of oxaloacetate inside the cell, then the oxaloacetate can actually be combined with acetyl coenzyme A to generate an intermediate of the citric acid cycle. And that ultimately can be used to help form ATP molecules. So if we have high levels of oxaloacetate, then we can feed the acetyl coenzyme A directly into the citric acid cycle to help us generate ATP. But what happens if we don't have enough oxaloacetate inside our cells? For example, if we're fasting. If we're fasting and we're not eating enough glucose molecules, then what the liver will do is it will begin the process of gluconeogenesis to ensure that the peripheral cells get enough glucose to use to produce ATP. So in the liver cells, the oxaloacetate will be used up to help form glucose via gluconeogenesis. And if we decrease the amounts of oxaloacetate, then we won't have enough oxaloacetate to combine with the acetyl coenzyme A to help generate that intermediate of the citric acid cycle and ultimately generate ATP. And so low levels of oxaloacetate and high levels of acetyl coenzyme A molecules means the acetyl coenzyme A molecules cannot be fed into the citric acid cycle. And under such conditions, what will happen is that acetyl coenzyme A produced via the beta oxidation pathway will follow a different reaction pathway. It will follow the pathway we call ketogenesis, the formation of ketone bodies. So once again, acetyl coenzyme A generated via the beta oxidation of fatty acids can only be used to form ATP via the citric acid cycle if we have enough oxaloacetate inside the cell. So if our carbohydrate intake is low, for example, we're fasting or in diabetics, and we'll talk more about diabetics and ketogenesis in the next uh, lecture, the liver will use up the majority of the oxaloacetate to help generate glucose via gluconeogenesis. And by driving the oxaloacetate levels to the ground, what that basically means is those acetyl coenzyme A molecules will be diverted to a different pathway known as ketogenesis, the formation of ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies are actually energy fuel molecules, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. First, let's actually discuss what we, uh, how we form these ketone bodies. So we have four important steps in the formation of ketone bodies. So in step number one, so let's suppose we have low levels of oxaloacetate, high levels of acetyl coenzyme A, so we can't convert that acetyl coenzyme A into an intermediate of the citric acid cycle. And what will happen is the acetyl coenzyme A molecules, two of them will be combined via process catalyzed by thylase. And we form acetoacetyl coenzyme A. We also release a coenzyme A. So in the first step, two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A are combined to form acetoacetyl coenzyme A, and this is a reversible reaction that is catalyzed by thylase. Now, in the next step, the next step is actually a rate determining step. And in fact, it's this step that drives this reaction forward because here we cleave a high energy thioester bond via a hydrolysis reaction. So we use a water molecule and we also combine another acetyl coenzyme A. So we combine these two molecules, we cleave a thioester bond release the coenzyme A, and we form an intermediate known as HMG coenzyme A. Now, HMG stands for, the H stands for hydroxy, the M stands for methyl, and the G stands for glutarol. So we form 3-hydroxy, three 3-methyl three glutarol coenzyme A, or simply HMG coenzyme A. And since, we're, and since we're synthesizing this, the enzyme is known as HMG coenzyme A synthase. So this is once again the rate limiting step of this reaction. 
And as we'll see in a future lecture, this HMG coenzyme A molecule also appears in the synthesis of cholesterol. So this HMG coenzyme A can also be used to synthesize cholesterol molecules. But in this case, it is used to synthesize ketone bodies. Now, once we generate the HMG coenzyme A, it then reacts in the third step. And this is the first step where we actually form a ketone body. So there are three different types of ketone bodies, and this is one of them. So HMG coenzyme A is cleaved by an enzyme known as HMG coenzyme A lyase. We release this entire molecule here and we generate the acetoacetate molecule. And notice that this is the base version of the acid. And so what that means is when we actually produce these ketone bodies, we will increase the acidity inside our body. And that can actually be dangerous as we'll discuss in a future lecture when we'll talk about diabetes and ketone bodies. So this acetoacetate molecule is actually a ketone body in itself and it will diffuse into the bloodstream. But some of these acetoacetate uh, molecules will actually be converted to other ketone bodies in the liver. So let's see exactly how this takes place in step four. Now acetoacetate has one of two fates. It can be converted in one of two molecules. So because acetoacetate is a beta ketoacid, it will undergo a slow and spontaneous reaction in which it will decarboxylate itself. And so we release a carbon dioxide, this molecule here, to form an acetone. And this takes place spontaneously without using any enzyme. Now, acetone cannot actually be metabolized by our body, so we do not use acetone to form any energy molecules. And what happens to acetone is it's simply released via the lungs, via breathing. And so physicians can actually test the breath of patients and they can detect high levels of acetone. And if that's the case, that implies that they have high levels of ketone bodies inside their body. Now the other pathway that acetoacetate can actually follow is an enzyme catalyzed pathway. And the enzyme that catalyzes this process is known as D3-hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase. And that's because it produces D3-hydroxybutyrate, the third and final ketone body inside our body. So we have acetoacetate, one ketone body, a second ketone body, the third ketone body. This is not metabolizable, but acetoacetate and D3-hydroxybutyrate can be broken down by our cells to form energy molecules, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, this process requires NADH because it's a reduction step. Acetoacetate is reduced into this product by using NADH inside our liver. Now, what determines the concentration at equilibrium of these two molecules? So, so do we have more of acetoacetate or do we have more of this product? Well, the answer to that lies to the ratio of NADH to NAD+. High levels of NADH or high ratio of NADH to NAD plus basically means we have way more, prod, uh, way more reactants and that will drive the reaction forward. And so high levels of NADH or high ratio of NADH to NAD plus basically means we'll have many D3 hydroxybutyrate molecules compared to acetoacetate. So once again, within the matrix of the mitochondria, the D3-hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase enzyme can reduce the acetoacetate into another ketone body known as D3-hydroxybutyrate. And the equilibrium uh, of these two molecules basically is determined by the ratio of NADH to NAD plus within the matrix of the mitochondria. Now the other reaction that can take place is the spontaneous decarboxylation of the acetoacetate to this non-metabolizable form, the acetone, which can be released via the breathing process. 
Now, when do we produce ketone bodies? Well, actually, our liver produces small amounts of ketone bodies normally. Why? Well, because certain cells actually prefer to use ketone bodies as the major energy source. In fact, the cells of the renal cortex and the heart prefer to use ketone bodies over glucose molecules. On the other hand, uh, cells found in the brain prefer to use glucose over ketone bodies. But if we're under certain conditions, for example, starvation conditions, the brain will actually use ketone bodies. In fact, 75% of the energy needs of the brain will come from the breaking down of ketone bodies. So we see that normally acetoacetate and D3-hydroxybutyrate are fuel molecules that are normally used by the heart and the renal cortex over glucose. In fact, under certain conditions when we're starving, the brain will also use ketone bodies. In fact, 75% of the energy needs of the brain will come from the breaking down of ketone bodies. So let's suppose our liver cell produces these ketone bodies, what will happen next? Well, the ketone bodies will move into the blood. And the great thing about these ketone bodies is they can actually dissolve in the blood. They're water soluble. And so they do not actually need any type of protein to move them to the target cell. So we see that ketone bodies are water soluble and they can move inside the blood without being transported by proteins such as albumin. Now, the ultimate goal of these ketone bodies when they arrive in the target cell is to transform those ketone bodies back into acetyl coenzyme A. Because now in the target cell, we're going to use that acetyl coenzyme A combined with oxaloacetate to help us generate those ATP molecules. So in the case of D3-hydroxybutyrate, that is transformed back into acetoacetate by the activity of this enzyme, but now we use an NAD plus to form NADH, which is the opposite of this step here. If we have acetoacetate going into the target cell, that simply enters directly in this stage. And the acetoacetate is transformed into acetoacetyl coenzyme A, and that is catalyzed by the enzyme CoA transferase. And so this requires succinyl coenzyme A. So we form succinate and acetoacetyl coenzyme A. And then this acetoacetyl coenzyme A reacts with a coenzyme A molecule and is catalyzed by thiolase to form two acetyl coenzyme A molecules, which, which then can be used to generate these uh, energy molecules. So we see that ketone bodies inside a target cell can be broken down into acetyl coenzyme A molecules. Now, we see that if we use D3-hydroxybutyrate, then not only will we ultimately generate the acetyl coenzyme A, we will also generate NADH inside a target cell. And so the NADH can actually be used by the electron transport chain to generate those ATP molecules. But if we actually use acetyl, uh, acetoacetate, we will not generate the NADH because we bypass this step, we only generate the two acetyl coenzyme A molecules. So, we see that if the liver forms these D3-hydroxybutyrate, then ultimately that target cell will be able to produce more ATP molecules because of this NADH. Compared to this acetoacetate, that will not be able to form the NADH inside the target cell. Now, another thing that I'd like to mention is the following. If the liver cell produces these ketone bodies, what stops the liver cells from actually generating back these acetyl, uh, acetyl coenzyme A molecules? Well, inside the liver cells, it actually does not contain coenzyme A transferase. So even though the other cells of our body do have coenzyme A transferase inside the mitochondrial matrix, the liver cells do not. And that's important because we don't want the liver to actually eat these ketone bodies, to digest these ketone bodies. So the liver generates the ketone bodies, but it cannot use the ketone bodies. So it can actually move those ketone bodies into the bloodstream so that other cells can use them. Now, 
the acetoacetate can actually also be used to decrease the levels of lipolysis because high levels of acetoacetate means we have high levels of acetyl coenzyme A in our body and we do not want to break down any more triglycerides inside our adipose tissue. And so we see that ketone bodies such as acetoacetate decreases lipolysis in our adipose tissue. And a final thing that I'd like to mention is red blood cells. Remember that red blood cells do not have mitochondria, uh, do not have mitochondria. And so what that means is if red blood cells do not have mitochondria, they cannot actually use ketone bodies. So cells like liver cells and uh, red blood cells will not be able to use ketone bodies as a fuel source.